the Pediatric Lounge, a podcast taking you behind the door of the Physician's Lounge to get a deeper insight into just what docs are talking about today. From the clinically profound to the wonderfully routine and everything in between. Good morning, our dear listeners. Thank you for coming back. Today, we have two phenomenal guests and Dr. Rogo are on vacation in Italy. So we won't hear George's, how are we going to pay for that today? We have Dr. Marconi, who is a frequent guest of the show. She led an innovative practice with urgent care certified pediatric and pediatric medical home that included asthma care, urgent care, mental health, and many other lines in Connecticut. And now she leads PM Pediatrics Mental Health Initiative and School Initiatives. Dr. Yambon works at Citrus Health in Florida, a large clinically integrated not-for-profit that cares for at-risk children and adults, including inpatient, outpatient, and emergency medical, mental health access that includes a psychiatric residency. In her spare time, I don't know how, she's the president of one of the best-run AAP chapters in the country, the Florida AAP, AAP chapter. It's a pleasure to see you both again. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gambon, Gambon, we always ask our guests, why did you become a pediatrician? I became a pediatrician because when I was in medical school, I went through all the different rotations and pediatrics was the last one I did. And I was already a little worried. I was like, oh, I don't want to do OB. Oh, don't want to do surgery. And when I went to pediatrics, I just enjoyed it. I enjoyed working with the teens and seeing the babies. And I was like, okay, this is for me. And Dr. Marconi, we've talked about this before, but why did you become a pediatrician? Yeah, so a couple of different reasons. First, my, my association with my physician when I was young was I was born in the Bronx and my mom had O negative blood. So she was seeing a hematologist and he became our pediatrician, like a family doctor. So when I used to go there, there would be all these bald people, older people. I could never understand like what was going on at that age. I didn't know. And I, I said, I want to be a doctor where there's more kids. So that kind of started me on the road. And then I became a candy striper in high school on the pediatric unit. And it just continued on from there. Would you kindly share with the audience all the wonderful things that Citrus Health does down in Southern Florida? And as well as all the initiatives or a few of the initiatives that you think we should highlight from the great work that the AAP Florida chapter is doing. I work down here at Citrus Health Network. I've been here 14, 15 years now. It's a behavioral health company that started originally providing mental health services by Dr. Mario Ardon, who is our CEO, over 30 years ago. And they cared for psychiatric patients. We have an inpatient crisis unit and recognized that they really needed to have primary care because mental and medical care, of course, intertwine and health is very important. You can't just treat the body, you have to treat the mind also. So they started a community health center, originally serving adults, and became federally qualified healthcare center and expanded. So originally when I was hired, there was very little outpatient pediatrics. It was mostly adult care, but they were planning on opening a center, which is where I am located now, which was originally opened as an OBN pediatric center. But now we're just pediatrics. We've taken over the whole floor. We're booming and we're busy. I'm in Hialeah, Florida, which is a very high uh, Latin population, mainly Cuban, but not only Cuban. The company takes care, our CEO and CEO to say, we take care of all the people that nobody wants to take care of. So we have shelters for homeless. We have foster care for kids with mental health. We have all kinds of different wraparound teams. We take care of kids who have been sexually trafficked. And a couple of years ago, we also were deemed by the state as the foster care provider for Miami-Dade and Monroe. Where a couple of years ago, we've always had, since I started here, psychology interns and residents. But uh, about six years ago, maybe seven now, the owners decided that they were going to open a psychiatric residency. So we are now training psychiatrists. As we know, there's a shortage of psychiatrists, which was shown and exacerbated during COVID. So we had already started the program and then also started Child and Adolescent Fellowship for Psychiatry. 
So in the clinic, I work at the clinic three days a week, seeing patients, babies. I have a lot of teenage patients because I cover a lot of the patients from the psychiatric units. So we have the emergent care units, which is our Baker Act units for kids who are imminently dangerous to themselves or someone else, which is an involuntary admission for 72 hours. And we have a residential adolescent psych unit, which I am the pediatrician who goes there. I go about once a week, sometimes twice, but usually once a week to care for the kids that are all admitted there. We have somewhere between 25 and 38 kids there at a time. So it's a very busy unit with a full therapeutic services, psychiatry, and all of the help that we can give that these give these children. So I love working at Citrus. I used to work at the University of Miami Jackson Health System, where you people probably have heard of the University of Miami, the international program down here with a medical school, and then Jackson Memorial, which is one of the largest county hospitals in the country. So I got a lot of education there and a lot of exposure to patients and then came on here at Citrus as a pediatrician. On my side role, I do a lot of volunteer work with the American Academy of Pediatrics. I've been involved at multiple different levels. I've been involved at the national level, um, serving on executive committees for the Council of Community Community Pediatrics and also the COPACHEF which is the Council on Psychological Aspects of Child and Family Health, which is a little bit of a mouthful. Also been involved with advocacy and different things in the community and reach out and read and a lot of different things that keep me busy in my spare time. For the last two years, I've had the pleasure of being elected the president for the Florida chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. So yesterday, actually, I was speaking to a young physician who just recently moved to Miami, is working at a fellow FQHC. And she was asking me, wow, why do you do the academy things? And I'm like, because where I work and where I live, I feel sometimes like you get all enfolded into what you're doing, especially when I was working at Jackson, which is basically a whole world in its own. And you don't have as much outside of the community that you know outside of Miami what's happening in pediatrics in other areas, what's happening in rural areas, what's down here where really the a huge Latino and Caribbean community is almost feels completely different than many other parts of our country, which is true, right? So different areas are different. I'm from New York, so I'm from a different melting pot, but I love it down here in Miami. It's uh, challenging and rewarding at the same time. So as president of the chapter, I work on with together with my board and our wonderful staff on a lot of different initiatives. We've worked on vaccines. Right now, we have a huge vaccine promotion campaign. We're working on trying to improve Medicaid reimbursement for pediatric providers. Some of the things that when you work for a company, you don't do the day-to-day billing and coding because you have assistance with that. It's very interesting things for me. I've always liked policy. I think it's very interesting and really want to focus on the medical home, everything that's involved, and helping our children and families, but at the same time also working with fellow pediatricians and providers to provide the best services. Wow. Good talk for an hour, but feel free to ask me any other questions. I will. Um, And Jean, remind our audience about the beautiful work you did with your practice up in Connecticut. Sure. I was in a private practice at a residency where I really became enamored with mental health and how mental health was health and is health, and that it was just part of the triangle of caring for the patient, the parents, and myself or the other pediatric experts, like a collaborative approach. So very early on in my practice, integrated behavioral health, and through the years went from a co-location model to a fully integrated model with care managers, social workers, child psychology, an ADHD specialist, a child psych APRN. So really the whole wraparound with a consulting psychiatrist and and added other programs as well to be as comprehensive as possible before even the word of medical home came around. And then we became medical home certified with distinction in uh, behavioral health. And about four years ago, left practice and joined where I am now at the start of COVID and really wanted to figure out how I I, I could maybe expand what's in practice on a bigger scale. And knowing that COVID came and PM Pediatrics, which is a national healthcare company in 16 or 17 states with 80 locations for urgent care, rapidly 
enhance their telehealth platform and thought what a wonderful way that might be to reach kids. So join them to develop and implement a behavioral health program that's community focused. We contract with payers and basically similarly following a collaborative model with care managers and, and a whole team approach. And about 18 months ago, recognized that there was a gap and the gap was schools where kids spend most of their day is not really connected to the pediatric medical home. It's not really connected to the behavioral health centers. There's this like huge fall off. So went and figured out how can we collaborate with schools as partners and deliver mental health and physical health in schools. So right now, building programs in schools with different tiers of, of, of care. And probably the, the notable one is a crisis um, component where we have an 800 number and we're available all day schools open for consultation to the schools for kids who escalate so they don't have to go to the emergency room. So, or because there's no immediate place kids could go when they're having some sort of an escalation. And our data so far is amazing. Less than 6% are going to the emergency department. Almost all of them return to school the next day. And the other thing, when kids leave the emergency room right now for behavioral health, 60% of them are not connected to care. Every one of our students gets connected somehow. So we see them for three to six visits, multiple phone calls until we get them to the right place. It's very rewarding at this level to see how we can really connect all of these broken dots or gaps that have evolved over time in, in the crazy healthcare system that we all work under. Wow, that's phenomenal. And then I, I also work in the academy. I was president for Connecticut um, for a couple, for 10 years, I think, and then moved on to national helping to, and, and I still work with the coding committee and writing a lot of how to get paid for behavioral health in, in a primary care practice, as well as um, expanding some of these things within SOPM, which is the, the section on practice and management, helping pediatricians to develop these programs in their practice. Wow. Well, that's, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt for a second. That's amazing. Uh, one of the other things that I didn't mention we do is down here in Miami, we have a Children's Services Council that's the Children's Trust that's funded by taxes that was voted on and approved several years ago. I used to be on the board of the Children's Trust. They have a Health Connect in our schools program. And where I work, Citrus is one of the providers, and it's a focus on providing medical and mental support to the kids in school with the goal of keeping the kids in school, decreasing absenteeism and decreasing the phone calls to the moms to pick them up. So we also, I think we have 13 schools, although of course Miami-Dade, we have hundreds of calls down here, but it's not only us. It's a countywide effort. Not all schools are covered, but it's all about funding, but working towards at least the highest risk schools that had the most absenteeism. So it's a great awesome. program. And it can expand, even if it's not full day coverage from school daybreak to the end of the day, but at least partial day coverage in more schools. And I know they're working on expansion and Citrus is very actively engaged in that. Maybe you um, could connect me. I would love to, because we're in Florida too, that we should yeah. talk offline. That yeah, definitely. sounds great. Definitely. So the reason I asked both of you is because you both have a huge experience in mental health. But also you have even a bigger experience in implementation in the pediatric office or clinic. And I've often heard the phrase that pediatricians are harder than hurting cats. And I wanted to walk through how you guys have been able to achieve so much because it takes several lovers, right? You got to convince the clinicians and you also have to convince the people that run the place that you're not going to lose money to do this good work that you're doing. And in conversation, it came up, the implementation of a practice, it's not a practice guideline, it's in the periodicity schedule of screening all teens for what the ASQ has for suicide as a strategy to prevent or decrease the number of children that were losing by suicide. And I want to start first by thanking Leah Gino, who taught me a lot of this, and in, in particular that the ASQS is the only screening tool that has been valid. So we shouldn't be using the PHQ-9-2 with those two screening questions because it has not been validated. And just as an add-on, Gene 
implemented this through all their offices in PM Pediatrics and wrote a beautiful article in the Pediatric Urgent Care Journal. So what first, what is the reason why we screen children in the urgent cares and in, in their adolescent well visits? Jean? Yeah, sure. I think most of us know the value of a screening tool is really going to be what are you going to do with the information that you have? So to screen and not have a plan of action for what you're screening for or the potential outcomes of that screening is problematic itself. And I think just to clarify, it's not that the PHQ is not validated. It's that it's not validated for suicide screening in kids. For adults, it's very sensitive for that, but in kids, it's not. And that's why the recommendation is not to use the PHQ-9, but to use the ASQ. So I just wanted to make that clarification. Thank you. Thank I think PHQ-9 is a validated tool in and of itself, but not for kids under 18 for suicide screening. And in adults, they're all screened with a PHQ-9. You go to the medical doctor, you go to the emergency room. JCO requires actually this screening. And when I was doing some of the work and research and some of the programming, there was no requirement to check children where children have the higher suicide rate than adults right now. So it was like, okay, why aren't we screening children at these points of service? Or why aren't we screening them maybe in school? And us as pediatricians, especially the teenagers, we may see them once a year. So screening on one particular day might not be enough because there's 364 days in between. So I think there needs to be a lot more work in screening and identification early outside of the medical home, so to speak. So at points of care like the emergency department or urgent care, just like for adults, we, we should be looking for some of these things. When we thought about implementing... Let me, let me interrupt you for a second. Yes. Your, your thoughts, Dr. Gumbel? Oh, I agree. We do the PH2 and then complete the pH, the nine, if there's anything abnormal. But we do talk to, I work with a lot of teens. So, and a lot of my teens are also seen in with mental health teens. So we do talk a lot about how they're feeling, what's going on, if they want to hurt anybody, want to hurt themselves, all of that. But we currently aren't using the screening tool you're talking about, but I do believe it's important. There are a lot of patients because we do the pH2, the GAD, we do Kraft. So we're screening for substance use, for anxiety. And if anything is even the slightest bit abnormal, our providers try to spend some time talking to them. Since we are co-located, psychology is here most of the time if we have any concerns. Even if all screenings are normal, then we can have somebody come in and talk to them. And then, Gene, when you try to roll this out through 16 or 18 offices in multiple states, what kind of problems did you find? There were lots, you can imagine, and it, it was 80 offices. And I think it's important when you're trying to implement anything new in a practice, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be you're adding nutrition or you're adding asthma or you're adding some new tool that becomes part of the periodicity schedule. I, I think it's really key to have a champion, to identify who the champion is for the implementation and, and the project, somebody who's going to really own it. And, and really has a vested interest in its success. And the second, I think, key factor is really explaining the why. Why are we doing this? And the why might be different to the different audience you have within your practice. So the why may be different to clinicians saying that, look, the ASQ will pick up suicide before kids might even be thinking about it or they might be thinking about it and nobody knows, and you have an opportunity to prevent that from happening. Most kids visit someone in the 30 days before they kill themselves in the medical field, and it's typically not their medical home. There is some diligence there in, in all of us having a vested interest in, in doing the screening. If you're talking to the, the medical staff, they'll, they, they would be like, why do we have to spend time doing this? This is just adding more work to our day. Understanding, having them understand why we're doing this and also the efficiency that can come with that. Hey, we're going to roll this out. We're going to try it in three places first. We're going to work out the kinks. We're going to make it as efficient using technology as possible. And then the other audience is the patient on the other side, who's going to explain to the patient why they're in an emergency room or why they're in an urgent care or where, wherever else. Why are we screening for this? Why are we doing this here at this moment? And most parents 
know these screening tools from going to their pediatrician's office. So it's not like we're in implementing something that's totally foreign to them. And when you start to talk to them and say, listen, the rates are so high, and then pump them with data. We had to work for a while to get the data, but we're finding a 4% positive rate, which is huge when, huge when you're doing a million visits a year, which is what we do. And half of those are serious. I could give you examples, go on and on. One kid came for a COVID shot and he had a noose in his closet. Wow. And he was just waiting for somebody to, and parents had no idea when they went home and because he, he told us that he had that. So even saving one life or two lives, it, it, it's when that office that picked up that child, they have the highest screening levels because it hit them so hard. Like it was so realizable that, wow, we're making a difference here. And then it's also connecting back to the medical home. So if we do the screen and they're not in immediate danger, we're connecting with the medical home, making sure that they understand this screen was done. And we make sure that the, the kid actually followed up with the pediatrician. Some of them have behavioral health specialists already. So we communicate with them because even if they're seeing a psychiatrist and, 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 and maybe Dr. Gabo, and you can comment on this, they don't screen every visit. Things change. So you can't even assume that someone who's being followed by a behavioral health expert is in the clear, like that you don't have to screen them. And I think there's just a lot of misinformation about who you can pick up and when. And we did a time study. So I, this was the other thing we did ahead of time. We wanted to be able to answer all the questions, like how this is not going to interfere with their work, how it's going to be built into the template of the HR. So it's a checkbox thing. The whole thing, if it's positive, took five minutes and 36 seconds. So we'll get back to that. because Right. Got- and then you oh. can charge a higher level visit, just like you would for an asthma, because the medical decision making now So there is money to be had in that visit. So again, just explaining every step of the way, you know, how this affects it. And this would be no different than an asthma visit that might take 15 minutes, actually, more than the five minutes and 36 seconds. So again, it's how you lay it out and how you communicate uh, what it is you're trying to accomplish. I think Dr. Gumbon had a thought. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think obviously we screen our teenagers with what I told you already. And I think additional screenings, yes, we do have that implementation barrier every time we add something. So we recently added the GAD and it's okay, more questions, more things to put in the chart, more things to enter the data. But then when the staff, when we do have abnormals, because we do, and then we're able to intervene and talk to the parent or call psychology or at least get them hooked up by phone if there's nobody personally here. I think the staff recognizes the worth in this. So it's absolutely worthwhile to do screenings. There's things that don't get caught. We just recently also implemented, we did a trial of doing the SNAP, looking for ADHD in kids 6 to 11 or 6 to 12, because that's an age that we don't do any screeners um, here. So we were like, we want to do something different. And those kids only come in after they're already having school problems. And after they're already acting out or having things. So we wanted to see if we could try and implement something in an age where we're already not doing a bunch of other screeners. And we did have several that came out positive and ended up hooking them in. So we're looking to try and roll that out across the board, at least during their physical visit. The teen visits, we do whether they're here for a well visit or a sick visit, because as we know, they don't come all the time for their well visit. So if they come in and they're sick, really take advantage of that and do the screeners here. Yeah, and identification is the first thing. And the great thing about where I work is there is somebody we can call if we have something abnormal. We're hooked up, we have an emergency access assessment center if that's needed, or we can just try and get them in as soon as possible. Of course, everybody doesn't get in right away because if they're not as high acuity, there might be a little bit of a delay, but we do have the follow through and the warm handoffs with the other members of our teams, which makes it so much better for the families and for us, because that way we actually know what's going on and we get feedback. So when I hear you both speak, the first thing that the clinicians will tell you is, I just don't have any more time. And that was the importance of that time study to show that it doesn't take that long to do. The parents also complain. The parents are tired of all these screening forms. It's like too much paperwork. But it is what it is, right? It, I, otherwise, a visit would take two hours if I sit down and ask you every screening question I'm supposed to do. 
But lack of time is something that I think pediatricians and primary care physicians really feel pressed for. There's just no more time. Yeah, and Uh, I'm not even saying that it has to be a formal screen. I think that going back to the review of systems, there's a couple of review of systems that are just key. And it's one question, looking at that child's eyes to eyes, how are you doing? Especially post-COVID, I I, I think we did a disservice by not really doing a good check-in. So it doesn't have to take a screening to do it. How are you doing? No one asks how school is going. It's not even in the review of systems, which is a huge misstep on my part, because usually those are the first signs that something might be going on with the kid. I haven't been going or my grades are really bad or and we need to use the children, the the students, patients, whatever venue you're in, checking in with them themselves. Like often we end up talking through the parent and we're not really paying attention to maybe what that child can say to us. And you say, oh, you add more time. It's one minute to say, hello, how are you? Give that personal touch. We've become like robots in practice, looking at the computer. And that's what I was finding was missing in practice as I made a transition was that personal piece. There's still, whether you work for a hospital or a behavioral center, or it, it still boils down to the patient relationship. And you can learn a lot from a facial expression if you pay attention. I put that out there. It doesn't always have to be a formal screen. It, it, it's more, how are you doing? One simple yeah, question. I always, when I'm teaching the psychiatry residents, I'm always like, when you walk in a room, so they see the babies because they're here for a general peds rotation. They all spend a month here in peds. Um, the capsules all come for a month. I'm like, the first thing is to just observe the child. Where are they in the room? What are they doing? Are they looking at the mom? Are they looking at their phone? If they're an older kid, are they listening to what we're talking about? And yeah, I always talk to the patients, even when they're two weeks old. So it's important to talk to the babies. And it's fun when you talk to them and they smile. Some of the teens don't smile, but I always try to talk to them, make eye contact, have them look at me ask them questions, ask the mom questions or the parent or guardian, whoever's because it's important for them to be recognized. They're not just there for us to listen to their lungs. So I asked them about school, about their baby brothers. I asked the teens if they get along or even, they don't have to be teens, the older kids, do they get along with mom? Do you tell mom when something's wrong or dad or who do you talk to? There's a lot of those extra things that I think are not in the review of systems, but like the heads assessment that's been around forever for teens. But I asked some of those questions to the older kids because, you know, the eight-year-olds now sometimes have phones Mm -hmm. and they're engaged in all kinds of different things. It's not like the eight-year-old, when I was an eight-year-old, I just wanted to go ride my bike. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot more going on. And I agree with you about checking in with COVID. I saw a lot of kids. It was hard. Those kids that came in, we kept our practice open the whole time. But we were more targeting working on the little younger kids to get them in for their shots, make sure they were growing. And then we expanded and started seeing after the first couple of months when the vaccines were available, more of the older kids. And But we didn't turn down any kids that the parents wanted to come in because they were worried about their kids. And so they came in and there was a lot of anxiety, staying at home, not going into work, not socializing, not seeing their friends, a lot of fear, had a lot of impact. A lot of impact. We're still Long seeing impact. We're still seeing chronic absence yeah. from COVID, like that kids have not gone back to school. Yeah. And then when they first opened back the schools and they wanted them to go, they were terrified. Watching the news, yeah. hearing what's going on, their parents' concerns. It's it was it's it still continues to be a stressful time. Thankfully, it's a little bit better, but it's still very hard to deal with a lot of those kids who didn't go to school and didn't integrate for a year and a half. So working to continuously give them support as much as we can and open the forum for them to talk about it when they're here. I feel like sometimes I saw kids during COVID, I'm like, it's really hard being home, really hard just being there using a computer all day. And I'm like, wait, am I talking about me? It was therapeutic for me to (laughs) to talk about it. It's hard to sit in front of the computer from home all day and just work. Uh, It's not very healthy. Um, the other thing I hear a lot from our colleagues is, and you, the two of you must have incredible insight to this. There's a tremendous lack of knowledge. You might be passionate about what food the child eats and know a lot about nutrition. 
but to keep up with nutrition, mental health, I don't know, the lipid metabolism and everything else that you need to keep up, sometimes you just don't have the time. How do we continue to educate our aging workforce that's also burning out at a relatively young age and leaving the workforce? So we have less pediatricians. How do we continue to engage them so that we can help prevent some burnout, but also give them the whys and the how to do some of these things without putting more stress on them? So I think there's a couple of things. I think stepping back and trying to get out of the rut of that day-to-day and how can you be innovative and efficient and what can you do on your little level to help transform how we deliver healthcare? Clearly, we can't get through that periodicity schedule and all of the anticipatory guidance that's on there. So how can you use digital tools? How can you use maybe sending things ahead of time? Like, these are the things that your baby should be doing, or these are the things your child should be doing. We need to get out of just the place of being in front of the patient to deliver care. So. Looking at how you can do that, I think, is key moving forward. And we need to take a stand as pediatricians in the transformation of that care. And look, the reality is there's less pediatricians coming out of practice. They're going to be needed more for the high acuity cases. So figure out in your practice, can you use a nurse? Can you use an MA? Can you use a care educator to do some of this work that can help pinpoint the places where you need to spend your time? For example. Your child comes in for a checkup and their BMI is 32. You know right away you're going to be spending your time talking about that. So what materials and resources need to get pulled so that you can have that conversation? Or if the screening tool is positive before you go in the room, how are you getting notified before you actually walk in that room versus sitting in that room and you open the chart and you're like, oh my God, the, the PHQ-9 is 20 or what? And now you're not prepared, right? So how do you best develop your workflows to be able to spend that time? And practices now are saying their volumes are down. I can't hear it enough. Like everyone is complaining. Okay, so book another appointment. You don't have to do it all at the checkup. Do what's the most important or most urgent and then say, listen, I really want you to come back because I need to talk to you about these things. And when parents hear they, you want them to come, they're going to come back. So we're our own worst enemy. We're not bringing the kids back and doing this work and people are dying for visits right now. That's all I'm hearing is how the volume is down. Okay, I'm sure you can find volume. So my question is more, how do we... So Dr. Gaman does it in her office. She's got students, psychology mm-hmm. students, residents, and fellows. But once you're out of outside of that realm, how do we continue to educate our workforce? Thoughts? I think you have to identify a, a yeah. staff member or hire a staff member who can do some of this for you at a low rate, who can do... I'm talking about his- educating other pediatricians. Oh, too. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think that... Even the fact that I teach psychiatry, they're not pediatric residents, right? They're psychiatry residents. It has to keep me on my toes, right? Because some of them just came out of medical school and they're challenging me on what do you do with the newest guidelines for, let's say, asthma. And then because they just heard it because they were in medical school. So I don't have residents every month. And some of the months I don't have them. I'm like, oh, all right, I have time to look up things. I have time to do a little studying. I think that pediatrician, and I tell the young doctor says, I tell everybody, my friend says, being a doctor, it's not like you go to medical school, you're done, and that's what you do for the rest of your life. There's ongoing CME, you're constantly learning, there's new meds, there's new treatments, there's new diagnoses, there's diagnoses that come out now I've never heard of. And they use, we use a lot of acronyms and I have to look them up sometimes because I'm like, what the heck is LDR? I don't know what LDR is. So I have to look it up and say, oh, wait, okay, we used to call it something else. I think it's an ongoing learning. There has to be a degree of self-motivation. I think pediatricians, and I say this all the time, are very caring providers. I'm going to include the pediatric nurse practitioners there and the nurses and PAs. We're very caring because we're engaging with kids who don't talk, kids you're just observing, kids who might have behavioral issues. is very different than dealing with adults all the time. So. There's a degree 
that I think of patience that needs to be involved. So patience with your patients, but, but also that ongoing learning and that quest for knowledge. So there's different ways to do it. Now that we've had COVID, there's 6 million webinars available all the time on anything you want to see that you could look to. I always look to the Academy for Resource or the CDC or one of the traditional medical schools have online things that you can look up or do a short little 15-minute vignette on the newest treatment for dyslipidemia. We just have to try and keep learning. And some of what we do that I like, that I try to do with my, the people who work with me, is once in a while we meet and talk. Like we talk about cases or what's going on with this kid or that kid, or what do we, the new vaccines to me is a perfect model for how you have to communicate. Okay, Bay Fortis is out. What are we going to do? Are we going to get it? Are we going to give it? Who are we going to give it to? Does everybody agree with giving it to the first day that the newborn comes in and the mom's overwhelmed because she delivered two days before? How are we going to explain it? How are we going to move forward? Is it in our EMR? How are we going to bill it? So there's a whole bunch of steps that is involved with the ongoing education, learning, and expansion, what I consider expansion of the practice. But yet in the same little small 10-minute visit or 15-minute visit, I do want to agree with you, Dr. Marconi, about one thing. On the days where it's a little bit slower, I tend to talk a little bit slower and spend a little bit more time with the patients because I know I'm just going to go and sit into a chart. So if there's not another patient can down the door at the moment or an urgent patient, I'm like, you know what? Today I could spend a little extra time talking about babies, what the baby's eating or how daycare is going or how is the mom handling the baby going to daycare or what's the kid doing after school, which sometimes you don't have time to talk about that. So if there's not a ton of patients scheduled one day, I'll take that time. I do tend to bring back patients that I'm concerned about Again, because there's not enough time in one visit. If you're worried about a kid who's starting to act out, not doing good in school, maybe hanging out with the wrong crowd, if you can get them to come back because mom's work schedule allows it, I think they're happy to come. Like you said, so and that's they come back primary. and we spend more time. It's more education for the parent, and but it's also for me too because it gives me more time to really concentrate. And then if I'm like, this kid is in. I don't know, such and such high school, and I don't know that school. Sometimes I like look it up. Okay, that school is, oh, it's a technical school, and maybe they're there because of whatever. I do agree that a little bit more face time with the family's help and not just sitting there documenting in a computer, which we tend to do a lot. We don't have computers in the room. So when I go in that room, it's like me, a piece of paper, and trying to jot down enough notes to remember everything I need to document later. Wonderful points. Be engaged, be present in the exam room. Um, It's incredibly, the beauty of primary care versus what I've done in the past was urgent care and emergency care is that I get to bring the patient back three, four, five times if I want to, till I get the diagnosis right. Mm -hmm. And every single time they come back, I'm building a little bit more trust with the family. This is, and this is for every disease. I have one kid in mind. She's Hispanic. Uh, nine months old, and she's been in the PICU twice because of a virus that caused her to be hypoxic and wheezing. And so I, I told her, if you kid get, here's a prescription for Orapred. The kid, just as much as sneezes, you give her a dose, and you're in this office at 8 30 in the morning, and you tell them Dr. Bravo told you to come in without an appointment, and the owner or I are going to see you every single time. And and she had one cold after the last PQ, and thank God she didn't become hypoxic. I saw it three times, but it, it's so much more reassuring for me. I, I feel like I'm doing what I can for this kid, keeping him out of the PQ, and she's not going to have a bad outcome. But we forget that. We don't do that as often as we should. The other problem that I hear a lot of my friends and colleagues say is there's a lack of pavement and when it comes to behavioral health. It really falls under our, our skin because, for example, we have the G2211 code, which is supposedly help augment some of the payments for all the work that is not reimbursed for in primary care. Truth is, in New York, most MCOs that are Medicaid are not paying for it. In Virginia, no MCO is paying for it. Here's, they dangle something at you, you put it into the computer, and then the office manager tells you, great idea, but nobody's paying. 
there's a wonderful code, I forget, it's 940 something, for care coordination, which is where we're going to have to all go, where I called Dr. Gambon with a difficult psychiatric patient and go, I'm stuck. And she talks to me for 20 minutes. And I'm reimbursed for that time because the patient's not there, but I'm trying to get a psychiatrist or a mental pediatrician or endocrinologist or a pulmonary doctor to try to take care of this kid because there's no appointments for them. In Virginia, when you go into the website, it doesn't even appear. It just doesn't appear for the Medicaid. You type it in, zero, nothing. They don't pay a dime for it. And then in Virginia and in, in New York, state, when you do a screening test for mental health, the MCO is paid zero. So you can create, screen all you want for your Vanderbilt. You're not going to be paid a dime. Medicare says they're worth 10 to 12 bucks of screening because that's what it takes your office to deal with that piece of paper. But we get paid zero. Herb, let me just chime in here. I think that working smarter and not harder is so important when it comes to coding and documentation and getting paid for what you do. So everything you just said, there's ways to get paid for it. It's just people do not spend the time to learn coding, which is like another language. So you can't just learn it once. You need to, in my practice, I made them take a course with EM University every year and they had to get a certificate because they would forget about how to code for things or how to get paid for what you do. And right now, with the 2021 changes, no one should be complaining about not getting paid for Vanderbilts because you include it as part of the work you did as long as you do it on the day of the visit. And you get paid for all of that time because you're documenting it. The same thing using the 99484. Almost every payer, including Medicaid, pays for that code. It's $40. And that covers not even you, your staff's time to find that child the referral that they need, whether it's, you know, making three calls, calling the parent, as long as they document at least 20 minutes, they can use that code and it's billed under the provider who did the visit and it's $40. So I strongly feel that there needs to be intention to know all of this and to get paid. Behavioral health plays pretty well in primary care if you know how to bid. So taking advantage of the coding resources the AAP has, I recorded one for them last year that's all on mental health and how to bill for it in primary care practice. But you have to seek out these things or have your billing people seek them out and you need to review it almost every 90 days. I can tell you when I was in practice, that coding book was next to my bed. It was like my, by every night I would reread it because I would remember something new that I should be doing. The same thing if you have a diabetic who needs behavioral health at that visit, you can use one of the health and behavioral codes to add time to a visit, but you have to know how to use it. So I pause because I understand the frustration of pediatricians, but they also don't want to spend money to have somebody come in and give them this kind of education. You have to spend some money to make some money to learn it. I agree. But at a certain level, if we agree that there's a G2211 code for primary care because they do longitudinal care, then it should be paid when I put it on there. Right. But that that, that shouldn't have to to fight about a higher level. Let's for the AAP, PPAC, or that's not going to be one pediatrician trying to make a difference. I have two people that are very involved in AAP here. So so I'm telling you, that this is important when a code comes out, and I know you not guys know this, but yeah. when a code comes out and everybody says, we're not paying for it, bill it all you want, we don't recognize There's it. There's a couple of steps, right? First, it's got to be even added. <laughs> Medicaid, it doesn't add it. it. If ACA doesn't add it down here in Florida, you can't even drop the bill because it doesn't exist. And then it has to be added to the EHRs to also be done. There's different steps, but yes, to get it, Paid does not happen immediately for many of these codes. I agree with you. And it's a state by state basis. It's not, if let's say Blue Cross Blue Shield says we're going to pay it across in all of the states where we have coverage, okay, but Medicaid doesn't work that way. So it's a state by state, I want to say quest <laughs> to move <laughs> forward. 
But it's not the only code. There are other codes that do exist that the codes are dropped, but they are not reimbursed or if they're reimbursed at a negligible level. But I do agree with what the doctor was saying that providers, that's why we have coders, right? Providers don't stay up on all of the changes and all of the education and all of the new things because it's hard. Mm -hmm. If I spend all my time coding, which people go and study and do that as their full-time job, then how am I keeping up with everything else? I'm not saying it's not important, but if you have good coders or people, and good coders don't mean that they just help you code. They actually come back and tell you, I don't know if you can hear kids screaming in the background, but they come back and tell you, hey, you want to code this, but you didn't document appropriately for us to do this code. Mm -hmm. So it's a back, it is an education level also. And and I think that that is a key point. That's a key point. A lot of employee physician get no feedback loop right. of that you're not documenting and that's why they deny this or that code doesn't get paid, but you could use this code. Let me jump in on that one, Herb, because there's a conflict of interest that occurs there. Okay. And I think a lot of us just don't recognize it or are aware. So when you are a certified coder, you are taught and you take the oath that you are going to look at the coding from the perspective of what the doctor put down. So it is conflict of interest for them to go back to the doctor and say, hey, if you did this, you could have coded that. So there needs to be a clinical auditor who's looking at what you're doing and saying, hey, you did this work. I know you did this asthma visit. You didn't do the asthma action plan. You didn't give them the peak flow teaching that adds another $22. You didn't do the the asthma control test screening, like you just lost $80 on this visit. A coder is not going to do that. You need to seek out other professional ways to look at those or bring someone in that is able to teach that to the providers. That is not going to come from your certified coder. And that's the misstep. But I agree with you. No, thanks for that clarification. I think our auditors were part of uh, the company where the coding was done. Doesn't mean that they were the actual coders, but that is a good clarification. But I think there does need to be some sort of feedback because we are not taught in medical school everything we need to document in a way that is going to coincide with billing, right? That education, again, more education has to happen. The AAP does have great resources for this. As you said, there are things available. We do have a a significant amount of physicians that don't work in private practice. So there's a little bit of disconnect with the coding and the documentation because that's handled by the university or the company or the hospital. So I do agree that there has to be some feedback in some way for physicians to know. Instead of typing out 50 words, if I click, it's a better documentation Mm -hmm. that correlates with a better degree of reimbursement. And I think too, when the residents come out of training, there is a misstep there as well. They are not taught this in their clinics most of the time or not in a way that's useful when they come into practice. So a lot of practices don't even have an onboarding program or recommended onboarding of how are we going to teach this new doctor to code? They don't have anybody checking the notes. Like So when I hired new people, they had to take the CM University And I audited their notes for 90 days. I looked at every single note. There has to be an investment made in your practice if you want quality care. It's not only about the money, but also to make sure you're getting paid for what you do. And someone needs to champion that. So again, it's another responsibility in a practice, even in a two-person practice, they could check each other. And then making sure when the new guidelines come out that someone is there who understands them and can implement them into that practice and then audit and make sure people are following it because people get lazy. They don't want to write four more words or they're not, yeah, they spend another 15 minutes with Mrs. Jones, but you know what? They they didn't write down additional 15 minutes spent, total time 75 minutes, because you can see if none of the pediatricians are billing by time, that you're hemorrhaging money because most visits in pediatricians require extra time because you are spending all that time with the patient. So this is a big place, I think, where practices need to step up and be more involved and not always just complain about how much they're getting. Make sure you're doing everything you can do at your end, and then let's have a discussion. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right about that. But 
it is frustrating to see that the codes are supposed to be reimbursed for or paid for come back at zeros. And, and that shouldn't happen. That really shouldn't that, happen. But that shouldn't happen. We can't. And, and, no, but we have to talk about it we because to try. Totally, yeah. all these chapter leaders who may not take Medicaid, may not run a practice, may do what Dr. Kamban does, but somebody else does all the billing. And unless you, you bring it up and speak about it, they are not aware of it. First of all, it's an educational campaign. First, it, this is a problem. And then let them do what they do on their leadership and advocacy rounds to try to get some of these problems resolved at the state and the federal level. And then the last thing, which I think you must have encountered when you're doing the, the screening at the urgent care level, was as much as we are trained as physicians, we don't like to give people bad news especially about diseases where we don't feel that we're experts. Mm -hmm. And that creates a lot of anxiety. What strategy do you guys use, you at the, at the PM Pediatrics, yeah. maybe Dr. Gamon, to get over that to help clinicians have these tough conversations? So we did a lot of things in regard to that. So we had a webinar that we went through, not only what the screening was, but all of the possible answers that could come out. Like, what if the kid screened positive? These are all the things you could do. So we scripted for them, their scripts, for the different potential outcomes. But we also gave each office a local resource guide. So, you know, if it was in White Plains, New York, we gave them all of the local resources that were nearby, but also gave them, if it's in New York, we gave them the access to the psychiatry, people's number, we also do behavioral health, so they were able to call us if they had questions. But honestly, 11 o'clock at night, if they had a positive, they would be on their own because we weren't always available. And you would do the best you can. And we created a lot of algorithms. If, this par if the parent is willing to sign the contract and make the child safe till the morning, all of those things were pre-populated and ready to just click a button. So again, really doing your due diligence to think about all of the scenarios, but also we educated the staff, not only the clinicians, but the medical staff on oh, what if what if there is a positive? What are you going to do? And then we did practice sessions back and forth. Like what if the parent refuses the screen? Okay, we allow parents to refuse it. We just document it. We're not going to argue with the parents. So I think being prepared is probably the best antidote to, to some of that. And you know what? Once they started doing it, they were fine. It's like learning anything yeah. new. When you learn to do stitches, right? The first one, like, or the first five, you're like, oh my God, yeah. oh my God. there's stitches. It's the same thing. It's the same anxiety. The the same first thing. 30. You just need to be supportive. We put somebody in the office when they launched it for the first couple of days. There was somebody there who was the champion who helped them through. So anything else new you add, you have to provide the support. And then the positive reinforcement. You guys did a great job. We give them a report every month. So we give each office a report. Hey, you only did 62% of the possible kids that came in. Do you know you probably missed two kids' positive screen? So you have to give them a little push in the back to, to say, hey, you guys can do better here. We know you can. How about you? So I, I know we're talking specifically about the screening, but we, not every day, but we do get bad news to patients. We do have kids that have super abnormal labs. We do have kids that get diagnosed with cancer. And we have to give that information to the parents. Obviously, if something abnormal happens. Recently, we had a little six-year-old girl that they called me from the children's hospital to tell me that she had a tumor in her spine. And we had to call the parents to come with her to tell her because I wanted to tell her in person. I didn't want, you know, the radiologist, the oncologist who she doesn't know to call parents and tell them. They knew something was wrong because we ordered the MRI of the spine. Like I pushed for that order to get it approved by the insurance to get it done. So they came and it was a team effort from our staff to give this bad news because mom was hysterical. The child was sedated because she had just come from the MRI. So thankfully she slept through the visit. The father broke down and he left the room and went walking down the hall. And one of our staff members just went to go listen to the dad. So it was a team effort when we had to give that and just Thankfully, it happened at lunchtime, so there wasn't a bunch of patients in, around. So we try to work together, but obviously that's not the kind of news we give every day. But we do see a lot of kids that have 
that are using drugs that the parents didn't know that are having sex, that are pregnant who the parents didn't know they were having sex, all these different things. So we just try and work with the patients, deliver the news for the child who had the tumor has been taken care of by several of us for years and her whole family. We had to like all take like a 10 minute break after we gave them all the news and set up everything for us to just hug it out and, and chat with each other to bring it down a little bit so we could go back and see the rest of the patient. So yeah, bad news is never easy to get, but I think that having other people to talk to when you have to give the patient bad news or parent bad news and other staff members has worked very well for us. And we also have a behavioral health team. If we need more assistance, we can actually, the company, we can call and have somebody come in and do a little mini intervention with us where we all decompress. Uh, we okay. haven't had to do that much, thankfully, but it, we've had to do it with some mm-hmm. staff members at different times because even in my old job, we had to do that a couple of times, which was not an integrated um, place, but the hospital did provide services if we needed something for a, if a child who shot themselves. And it was a kid we've been taking care of for years. Um, we needed some support sometimes. So it's good to know that we're in a smaller practice. Hopefully you have a little bit of a support group or access to somebody. But in the bigger hospital systems, bigger facilities, a lot of times there is somebody that can come in and work it through with the staff or between the staff just working together and just get ourselves together to go on to the next one. It's not like a pick you or emergency room where you have a lot higher rate of deaths and no, I'm, you know, I'm glad you brought illness. I'm glad you brought that up because we had two kids die from the flu within five weeks of each other. Awful. Healthy kids, vaccinated. One was five, the other one was well, actually the twelve year old refused the flu shot. But within five weeks. So the hospital, we actually reached out to the local hospital and they sent a grief counselor to our staff because yeah. it was really tough. So even if you don't have the resources, like you said, you reach out to the community to help you. But I agree, some of those cases are so tough that you do need that extra help because that is really wearing on not only you as the doctor, but your staff are also. I think we forget it. Well, I agree. We had two babies die of SIDS very close together. And it was like, okay, what was wrong? What did we do wrong? We automatically, it's like, we did something. And then, of course, we investigated the cases because we did that internally to see, was there anything we missed? Or we had to provide support to the providers who were the main caregivers for those families because to have two babies die with no reason within a couple of weeks of each other was scary, scary for us. But yeah. I think because it is scary for us, because it does affect us, because we do also have feelings That makes us better providers. The parents can tell we care. The community knows we care. We don't just brush everything off. And I don't know if that's just being a pediatrician, just being who we are. We're caring for kids. So we have a lot of, like I said before, we have to have patience and empathy and work with the families. And so I think we have very good skills, most of us, at least the ones I know, on communication. So... Doesn't yeah. make it easy sometimes, but so you know, I have to plug some things here. So first of all, our mutual friend Dr. Rani does a phenomenal job with that CME at Nicholas Children's at Reeves Spring, and I think he also does a wonderful job with you with the AAP meeting. And this year is going to be in Orlando first weekend, the first week Labor Weekend, is that correct? That the. Florida chapter is Labor Day weekend. The national, actually, AAP is later Later. in the month in Orlando also. But Ronnie is king of the CME, I told him. (laughs) He's He's amazing amazing putting these conferences together. But on those two conferences, the Florida AAP chapter and the Miami Children's are phenomenal. And this spring, he had a speaker from Nicholas Children's Anthony, who is a neonatologist, and he's a phenomenal speaker on how to deliver bad news or have difficult conversations, and wrote a book about it. And he is just phenomenal. It just His podcast is published today, but it's worth listening to about the intentionality of how you can deliver 
bad news. And bad news may be as simple as your star baseball player's son is not going to play for six weeks because with this kind of injury, he will, could do more harm than good. And so he's going to have to sit on the bench. And here's this kid's dream of getting a scholarship and going to college and all of that family investment destroyed in a minute. It's not necessarily only a tough, um, but we have tough conversations all the time in the exam room. But he does a wonderful job of explaining all of this. And I think it's worth reading the book. It's a phenomenal human being, a fellow pediatrician. I want to ask you a little bit because it's become my passion now is screening for diabetes. And many of the listeners know the reason I think we should screen for diabetes is because apart from when I was in medical school, you only knew the child had diabetes when their insulin requirement and their glucose was 800. Today, we can tell years before by screening from drawing their blood or getting a finger stick, screening for autoantibodies and knowing which children are going to be at risk for ending up with diabetes as we knew it when I was in medical school. By doing that, we can prevent 90% of the cases presenting in DK, which is, to me, a very scary disease. And we go through the same cycle of what we just talked about. When I was in medical school, the autoantibodies didn't exist. So I have to learn a whole new way of thinking about diabetes, a whole new way of how do I stage it, because there's stage one, two, or three, depending on where your metabolism. We had an inclination that it was an autoimmune disease, but we didn't know anything else. Now we know it's an autoimmune disease. The end organ damage is the pancreas. And when you need insulins, because there's no more beta cells left. And we have to do something to educate ourselves and then have a really difficult conversation with a parent where the autoantibodies are positive, but their glucose is totally normal. And we know that those kids, within five years, 45% of them will require insulin. Within 10 years, 75%. And the lifetime risk is 100%. But at least we can prepare them for that day. And with some simple education, and what I did with the asthmatic nine-month-old, come back, get sick, come back. Because I want to catch that hyperglycemia quick and do a urine test to make sure you don't have ketones. And I could save that kid's life, potentially. And if we're all doing it together, we could save one or two kids a week to die from complications of DK. How do we educate our colleagues in our workforce and how do we get this across the line? Because it's just as equally important as all the other screening that we do. And how do we ask government to invest in our children? This is an upfront cost. But in the long run, it saves money. But prevention costs money. Biomography costs money. Colonoscopies cost money. Vaccines cost money. But they save lives and they change the world. So how do we? I think it's. I think think it's like anything else that's new, and and I can just equate it to our practice. We we screened for lipids long before it became a recommendation, and it didn't get paid. And we told parents, we're like, look, we want to screen. Your husband has the high cholesterol. Your like whatever the family history was, and we explained it to them. So. We did what we felt was right or what was the right thing to do. We didn't necessarily always wait. I screened for mental health long before those tools were ever had a code attached to them because we felt it was good medicine. So some of this is your own personal take on how much are you willing to step out of the box? Does it require payment? Okay, maybe it does. But if you bring a patient back and talk to them about anything, you can still bill for it. You might not get paid for the lab test, let's say. So maybe you have to have that discussion. And especially if they have a high family incident, their cousin has type one or their uncle had diabetes, people might pay for it. And they paid for the lipid tests. And unfortunately, that's how our society works. And 
sometimes if you get enough momentum on people who are willing to step out of the box, you get there quicker. It's just like for the managed care plans. Just because they don't pay for it doesn't mean you shouldn't bill it. People are like, oh, we're just not going to bill it. No, that's the wrong answer. You should still bill it. It's the work you did. And eventually they might pay for it. So I think, again, this is cutting edge medicine. It always takes a while for the establishment, the AAP or whoever else it is to build these protocols or algorithms. So I I think if you can educate, really do a good education and the data is really supportive, you'll find pediatricians who are willing to do it and you'll find families that are willing to get it done. If the families don't want to do it, they can refuse, but at least you offered and you educated them. This is new in medicine, just like when we started doing lipids, just like when we started doing mental health. Why are you screening my kid? My kid. If you ask my kid about suicide, they're going to become suicidal. It's the same mentality of providing the best information you, you, you can. So I think if this is the data that's coming out, and I've read it, you've shared it with me, I would have no problem talking to a child about that. And maybe in your practice, you hold a clinic for it. So you do a group meeting on what this is, or you send out an email, like you have your practice newsletter, whatever, however you communicate with your patients. Hey. This is the latest and the greatest. This is how it works. Insurance not paying for it yet. And as it takes time, if you would like to have this screening for your family, please call our office and schedule an appointment. At least you've offered it. Your thoughts, Dr. Gumbel? I absolutely agree. I think I'm going to go back to a minute with uh, you were talking about how do you get all of the pediatricians or all of the providers to know what's going on? So first we need the widespread education of the testing being available so that the doctors or the providers in the practice can discuss, are they going to implement it? How are they going to implement it? Who are they going to implement it on? I know, I think you had um, referred to doing something more like universal screening, but I don't even think the targeted screening is happening yet, um, which is being paid for in Florida, at least by Medicaid. I'm not saying all the private insurers, but it has to be targeted screening that is justified somewhere, someplace in your documentation, but it's not widely known about yet. So it is new. However, that is, you'll need your early adopters, people who will promote it, people who will discuss it, people who put it out there so that more people will start doing it. Same, you know, the new vaccines, I keep going back to vaccines, you know, going back to Bay Fortis, how many providers are giving it? I know there was a shortage last year, but how many did their pre-order? How many are going to give it? How many have started? RSV season is already on here in South Florida. Maybe not everywhere else, but is everybody getting prepared? It's anything new, right? It doesn't just, nobody says, maybe one person says, hey, that's a great new thing. Let's do it tomorrow. But not 67,000 pediatricians across the United States have that moment altogether. It has to catch on. Sharing the data, sharing the information, people learning about it is the first step. Then you start ordering it. Some places it might be reimbursed or not. I do like the idea of proposing it to parents. That did happen in the past in Florida with the expanded newborn screening that it was not originally funded, but it was available if parents wanted to do it. They were able to pay for it. And there's other things that have been like that too. There are parents I have that I cannot get them approved to use level buterol but they don't want albuterol, they'll pay for the level albuterol because they can buy it for cash. It just can't be run through the insurance. So parents are willing to take care of their kids for the most part if they can afford to. And if they get the education, they might be willing to pay for the extra test or the extra study. Doesn't mean I think every single test and study should be available for every single patient. Or they'll come in and say, I want these 50 tests today. Dr. Google. Yeah. Or a yeah. whole body MRI, which is now yeah. available for cash. Right. Well, pet scans, head to toe every year. There's a lot of different things. A lot of stuff in adult medicine that's new and breaking too, that is not paid for by insurances. But it's up to people if they decide if they want it and if they have the funds to be able to pay for it. But anyway, those are my thoughts. I think the first step is getting the providers educated as to what's available and what the recommendations are. And then they can start implementing. And if the funds don't follow yet, they probably will later at some point for something like this. Yeah. They can, yeah, they the, can use their, what do you call it? HSA accounts for this kind yeah. of stuff. So, so they also like, Medicaid programs will pay for it. And so will most commercial payers for the screening. 
And if a, if a family with a high deductible doesn't want to incur the cost, which is between $70 to $130, there's three national studies that will do the testing for the child for free. They'll, they, they're, so they're funded by, tr- by grants. I think, George, the best way to, to do this is to package it up. Give a practice, the pediatrician, the full suite of what you need. The information for the parents, the consent sheet, the what if it's positive. The I think we could do a better job of delivering to practices materials that are self-packaged. So it makes it easier and everyone is not recreating the wheel for the workflow. I think that's a big barrier. They need the recipe, how to actually do it. Identify the champion. These are the steps you take. This is the lab you use. This is the phone number. This is the resources. Fill in the endocrinologist name here if it's positive. Script it as best you can to make it the easiest for them to implement and understand. Yes. Any other thoughts, Dr. Kambon? No, I don't have anything else to add to that. But it that whole package or the toolkit, as yeah. uh, we have a lot of toolkits at the academy, it's just so helpful and it helps makes it easier for the providers and much easier to roll out if you already have something come and say, this is what you do. The algorithm is clear. So, Any questions at that I didn't ask that you think are important for the audience to hear? No, I, I asked enough. <laughs> How about you, Eugene? Any questions that? No, I think you're right on target with, I think the theme here is to try to implement something, to pick a champion, make a workflow, support your staff as best you can. And follow up and keep yourself up to date and educated. And I think adding some of these things brings back some vigor in medicine, gets you out of the run. This is something new. Let me educate somebody. Let me, to me, it was always exciting to do something new. Maybe to some people it's a burden, but it gets you out of the mundane. Oh, wow, this is very cool. This is something new I can offer to my patients that gets the patients buzzing about you. Maybe you'll get more patients because now you added something that Dr. Jones down the block doesn't do. So I I look at all these things as moving forward and refeeds yourself, gases you up, give you more energy, take a breath. Yeah, but the opportunity to make a difference in a child's life by click of a mouse. To me, I'm just in awe and I still don't think that I'm a pediatrician. I really don't. Like I get to order stuff for kids and make them better every day. It's such a gift. I don't have to ask the legislators to change anything. I just click on the mouse and hopefully I do good every day for this kid. Thank you very much for your Thank time. You. I admire you both tremendously for the work you've done. And it's always a joy to see you and talk to you. Thank you for today. Yes, thank You're you. Welcome. Thanks for see providing you. this service to pediatricians and other pediatric experts. It's a, it's our pleasure. It really is. Hope to see you guys soon in Orlando. Ciao. Oh, very soon. Bye. Coming up soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. This has been a production of the Pediatric Lounge. On the show notes, you will find links to our co-host and other important notes as well as a timetable of the topics discussed today. Don't forget to follow us on social media and subscribe to wherever you listen to your podcast. Leave us a great review as it helps us greatly. In the meantime, we will see you next week the pediatric lounge the conversations are not intended as medical advice and the opinions expressed are solely those of the host and the guest